So congratulations for having um, written such a really remarkable book. Um, could we have the first slide, please? Well, while we are waiting for the first slide, here we are, okay. Next, please. Next slide, please. Okay, well, Hugh, um, while we're waiting, let's start with the most vivid character to come out in a very long time, John Quinn. Can you tell us about him, please? Oh, uh, <laughs> looks like we're, we're starting with P Picasso. It's hard to keep him out of the frame, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well. Uh, first of all, I'm I'm thrilled to be here. I I'm really um, uh, delighted to be uh, speaking to you this evening. Um, so, John Quinn uh, may be unknown to many of you if you haven't um, haven't read the book. Um, a largely forgotten figure, although uh, as James uh, and I were were discussing uh, earlier at the recent sale at Christie's last week. Um, uh, the Paul Allen collection. They were actually two works from uh, the from the Quinn collection. So he was this imp amazingly important figure uh, in the early 20th century art world and literary world. Um, and one of the things to know, of course, is that Picasso was a literary figure. You know, he, he surrounded himself with poets and and writer friends. And this was uh, uh, John Quinn was his leading patron in, in these early years of the 20th century, the first great American Picasso collector uh, and a remarkable figure who kind of comes out of nowhere. Uh, uh, he, he's um, Irish American uh, from sort of small town Midwest, uh, self-made, um, kind of emerges on the scene in his early 20s. He somehow gets into Harvard Law School uh, he he goes to Washington on the coattails of an Ohio uh, governor who's become secretary of the treasury. And uh, he lands in New York um, in his early 20s and kind of sets out to to transform American culture. And it begins with it begins with literature. Uh, he, get, he gets into the Irish Renaissance and uh, kind of adopts the entire Yates family, uh, W.B. Yates, his father, John Butler Yates, his brother, Jack Yates, who's a great um, Irish artist. Um, and then he moves on to the Paris art world. And so in this very brief span of time, uh, really from the teens to the, the mid 20s, this figure, virtually any any writer or artist you could think of uh, among the great modernists had some connection to John Quinn in this period. And I think we'll, we'll see that in, in the, maybe the next slide. Next, please. Um, just to qualify about this uh, Christie sale, they actually introduced the Georges Seurat saying, this painting is in the collection of John Quinn. Now I've got to tell you, Hugh, that never would have happened before your book. You've brought him out. He had been known to very few people. Uh, okay, so here we have um, a photo of some of the people that you were just mentioning. So these are all, yeah, yeah. So, so every one of, of the figures in that in that picture you would you would know from the literary world: Joyce, Pound, a Ford Maddox Ford, and then who is this guy? <laughs> John Quinn, the, the guy with the high collar. Um, very tall, um, uh, sort of planted among these 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 great literary figures, and um, this was the world he inhabited. Not only did he support these writers, uh, he wanted to know them. He wanted to be part of the creative process. He wanted to receive the wasteland uh, in draft. You know, T. S. Eliot sends it to him. Uh, his companion. Uh, Gene Foster reads it to him while he's shaving. He commands it to memory. Um, he, this is this is the kind of guy he is. He wants to know Picasso. He wants to know Brock. He wants to talk to them about the war. Um, and this was very new at the time, of course, because the great art, art collectors of the time weren't collecting, they weren't collecting modern art. They weren't collecting living art, art that was created by artists who were alive. And, and so this was an entirely different way of thinking. 
Thank you and your research. How in the world did you find out that um, Gene Foster read T.S. Eliot while he was shaving? <laughs> well, it, it's 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 a it's a wonderful story, and Jean Foster herself is a, a is I think w- we have a slide of her um, later in the sequence. Uh, one of the most beautiful, um, <laughs> wi- widely regarded as one of the most beautiful um, uh, people uh, in this in this era. She actually was picked off the street um, in the year 1900 um, by a, an editor at Vanity Fair, and this is the great heyday of of um, modeling for uh, illustrators. And so she was a um, um, a Gibson girl. Um, and she went on from there to be a literary figure. And she knew many of these same writers uh, before she met Quinn. And so at the time that um, Elliot is sending Quinn the manuscript of The Wasteland, she is, is his close companion, confidant, and um, he relies on her for everything. And apparently he he would do this for his legal cases as well. So Quinn was by day a lawyer on Wall Street and he was famous for appearing in court without any papers ever. He would just memorize his case, case, case work. And apparently she would read his cases to him in the morning. And um, so, but, but how did we know this? They were both in, in, in sort of, um, I mean, the the paper trail that they left was immense. So Quinn was a correspondent who wrote um, 20 page letters uh, every day. Um, Jean Foster was a a great diarist and letter writer herself. So we have this, it's this incredible moment in time when you can actually recreate sort of moment by moment what is happening uh, in the the art world, in the literary world. Um, Next part, please. So one of the things that's remarkable about Hugh's book is that he takes you on the journey of a collector in a way that really I've not read in a very long time. One of the paintings we follow is Henri Rousseau, this majestic masterpiece, which is now residing at MoMA. Um, Hugh, could you tell us just briefly about um, John Quinn's apartment, this rambling 11 room apartment, what he would do at a dinner party? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so so uh, he he ne- apparently never hung a painting in his life. So he had this amazing collection, which eventually amounted to uh, well over fifteen hundred paintings, uh, of, of which the core were several hundred of you know the preeminent um, avant garde work out of Paris. And he never hung it up. He he had you know stacks of canvases uh, throughout his apartment under beds. Um, behind tables, um, and he would have these dinner parties, and he would unveil his latest uh, shipment from Paris. Um, but he he would kind of tantalize his guests, so so they couldn't see it right away. Um, they would have to sit through dinner. There would be conversation, and then you know by the time um, you know coffee was served, they they might be invited into the the um, the living room, and he would have some. A astonishing new thing um, that none of them had 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 seen before, and the the greatest example, of course, is the Sleeping Gypsy, uh, which he acquired in 1924. And here again, there's this great con- connection to Picasso because Picasso actually discovers this painting, literally dis- sort of discovers it. I mean, it had been painted 20 years earlier, over 20 years earlier, um, completely unknown. Rousseau had become this obsession to the Paris avant-garde. Picasso and his friends had known Rousseau at the end, end, at the end of Rousseau's life. Uh, he died in 1911, I think. So this is about a decade later. And still, the, the corpus of Rousseau paintings was not completely known. And so this, one, this, this now recognized as the greatest Rousseau was, was not known, even in Paris. And Picasso is one of the first to see it. He immediately thinks of Quinn, and there's this amazing chase, which you you will have to read about in the book. How does how does it end up in New York? Um, but Quinn uh, unveils it at one of these evenings in his apartment to a small group of friends, um, and uh, that is only the halfway into the story. It has a much longer trajectory before it ends up uh, where it is today. 
and where where I hope um, I I hope you will go to see it. Uh, it's recently been um, conserved um, at, at the at the MoMA. Before we move on to the next, I just want to mention one of the great things about this adventure in the collecting is how they communicated with cable and that the cables would sometimes get diverted to the wrong address and they would say, you must send us a reserve uh, you, to hold it. You must send us, you know, $500 or something like this, which um, so it's very, very vivid. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, there she is. Um, the amazing thing is they didn't marry this woman. I mean, she kind of had it all, right? I mean, a, 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 an astonishing figure, and and uh, one of one of my, one of the interesting discoveries I've in in my research was, um, and and we'll, I'm sort of jumping ahead here, but the Armory Show, which is the kind of great turning point often in in American art history. She was one of the only critics that went to the show, wrote about it, and understood the art. And she, you know, she she said, you know, there there are about a dozen really amazing um, artists in this show of hundreds and hundreds of artists. And she's talking about Picasso, Brancusi, Brock, um, Durant. She she kind of like names name checks uh, sort of all the artists who then go on to be the center of Quinn's collection. And she hasn't yet met Quinn. It's just this kind of astonishing um, prescient mind that she had. Um, and she knew artists and writers. And um, of course, um, um, John Butler Yeats, um, father of W.B. Yeats becomes a kind of poetry coach to her. Can you imagine being coached by the father of Yeats? Uh, um, she publishes several volumes of poetry of her own. Um, and she's emerged from the mountains. You know, she's a mountain girl from the Adirondack Mountains, um, you know, grew up um, in, in, in poverty. Her father was a lumberjack. Um, one of the interesting themes in this book is that, like, like John Quinn, uh, she is an outsider. And I think these figures who changed the art world all had a kind of outsider background. And it's very interesting how they push against uh, the kind of prevailing conservative American culture and supported this, this sort of radical new, new art. One little footnote you had about her, which I found astounding was that at age 15 in this tiny school, she became the teacher for her class. I mean, uh, what a remarkable woman. Uh, next slide, please. So maybe we're going to go through some of these in the thought of actually making it through this incredible PowerPoint, which was put together, by the way, by my team at the gallery, um, Dylan Everett, Casey Cross, and Maria Klamis, and I'm grateful to all of them. Um, and one thing I want to talk about while we're speaking about books, I didn't have a chance to say, we live in a town of 2,000 people. We have a remarkable library and a remarkable bookstore. And that is more than many towns in America. And so I'm very grateful for those two. And I did want to mention that. So uh, Brancusi, is there something we want to say or should we sort of flip through a little bit, Hugh? Well, again, like like um, the, like those literary figures we saw around Quinn at the beginning. So, so Quinn by the teens is surrounding himself with the great artists of uh, and 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 rem let's remember at this point in time no one was saying that you know Brancusi is the greatest sculptor of the 20th century this was this was Quinn's eye this was uh you know with his friends uh here's Yates mm -hmm. uh, and I think we have a few more here uh, yeah. T.S. Eliot I mean, it's just astonishing that you you it's you can't come up with a name that was associated Quinn, who's sort of not important in some way today. Like he really did have a kind of prescient taste for what was enduring, what what would be a uh, hundred years later. Um, now, I'm just going to say one thing about so, so this is uh, Mademoiselle uh, Pogani. Uh, this is the great first sort of. Uh, encounter with Brancusi of that Americans had, and um, uh, this uh, was in the Armory Show a year. It was so it was created in 1912 in the Armory Show a year later, and was one of the most commented on works in this show. Um, uh, <laughs> mostly not in in a friendly way at all. 
Um, I mean, it's just, it's hard. To, one of the, the things that, that's required of understanding this story is, is sort of an act of time travel. You kind of have to erase everything you know about art today and our kind of jaded reality and imagine what it was like to encounter a work like this in 1913 uh, when, you know, a Rodin was radical, but, but this was just, you know, <laughs> how do you approach uh, such a, such a, such a work? Um, and Quinn became one of the greatest Brancusi collectors. Um, you know, Hugh, you do such a good job in describing how John Quinn lived with the art. He would walk down these corridors and the sculptures would be in the corridors, in the hallway. And then you'd go into these rooms with huge piles. Um, it's absolutely incredible. The next slide, please. Wow. And this this is this is um, the the other sort of great um, sensation piece in the Armory Show. Uh, it's interesting that Americans didn't know anything about Cubism, uh, of course, and their first encounter is actually not um, Picasso and Brock, but Duchamp, who is not really today remembered as a Cubist, but this work was. Um, um, just, just uh, beyond the pale, shocking, the, the, a kinetic, um, <laughs> a, a, a pile of shingles uh, falling down the stairs. I mean, people came up with all sorts of analogies. Um, this um, Duchamp was, again, one of Quinn's friends. He arrives sort of destitute um, in New York um, uh, a, a year into World War I, and Quinn picks him up and, you know, <laughs> finds him a place to stay, gets him a job at, the, at a library. He's a librarian for a while. Um, at one point sends him on vacation because he looks thin. Um, um, du <laughs> Duchamp is a little hungry. I'm sending him to the Jersey Shore. Uh, this is sort of Quinn. This is how he, how he um, sort of acquired the, these, these artists. And he acquired the art, but he also acquired the artists. Um, and this was a very new, a very new approach. Um, I mean, this is in a time when New York, uh, collectors were buying Holbein's and, um, <laughs> let's look at the next slide and we'll, here we go. Stieglitz, um, you very vividly portray what happened with Stieglitz in the first Picasso show. Um, there's this kind of staggering, um, inability to sell the work. Um, which eventually led to being offered to MoMA $2,000 for 84 works, $12 a piece, and MoMA <laughs> turned it down. Uh, not MoMA, the Met, excuse me. Um, next slide, please. So, so and, and I, I'll, I'll just say very briefly, I mean, Stiglitz... This gives you an idea of there was a radical culture. It was just so in the margins of what was happening in New York. And, and, and Stieglitz was um, a pioneering figure, but he, he never, he, you know, he never made any money off of any of this. Um, uh, and this is the second, in, by 1915, he's already doing his second Picasso show. And once again, nothing sells. I mean, he, he had to make it excuses to say, oh, it was the war. Um, <laughs> but no, um, Americans didn't want to go near Picasso in 1915. I think also it's really interesting to look at, we've already seen it, but the installation is so radical. Until that time, installations were salon style, really, really cluttered. And kind of the brevity of that installation, the breathtaking sense of daring of putting a sculpture in the three dimensionality of that installation is completely remarkable. So here we are with the first Picasso actually in our presentation from 1910. Um, do you wanna talk about this work, Hugh? Well, I, I'll just say very briefly, I mean, this was one of the 83 works which appeared in that first American show in Stiglitz's gallery in 1911. And, and when I say gallery, this is a kind of a garret, uh, you know, a top floor attic, uh, uh, largely unheated. I think there's a wood stove in the back, but but Stiglitz is just keeping this going on a shoestring. He borrows 83 drawings um, and 
you know, one of, he makes a single sale and then he just feels terrible about this whole thing. And he ends up acquiring this great work, the, the standing female nude, um, which was really one of, one of the great masterpieces in this, in this early show. And he, he acquires it um, and then has to return all these other works unsold uh, to Picasso. Of course, the Metropolitan did turn him down in that <laughs> tantalizing offer. Um, uh, what would they be doing with you know, 80, 80, 82 Picassos? Um, um, it's just hard to imagine today both the, 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 the sheer strangeness of, of the encounter and this is in a time again before reproductions. Uh, you know, you can get black. You know, Quinn himself, when he's buying works, he has to get a black and white photograph sent uh, from Paris. So there's very limited access to images of new art, and you have these raw encounters, and they were very shocking to 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 the people that that uh, went to these early shows. You, I think maybe what we'll do, since we do want to get to Alfred Barr, is let's move through some of these slides. Uh, could we have the next, please? So this is just, uh, yeah. So Alfred Knopf, we've already talked about, uh, you know, his literary affiliation. The next slide, please. Next. Okay. So, well, this is a very interesting thing because, um, Hugh, you bring up that at this time, the Rembrandt was selling for half a million dollars. And the next slide, please. The Velazquez was uh, Henry Clay Frick paid $475,000 for this. And we're talking about 83 Picassos for $2,000. Next slide, please. Uh, more of the people in a circle. Next, please. Man Ray. Um, so this is one of the dealers actually, if you go back. You know, Hugh, one of the things that's so interesting about this book is it's the plight to get an exhibition in MoMA, a museum, but you draw very vivid portrayals of the art dealers who really carried the ball down the field for quite a while. And one of them is, uh, if you could explain about- uh, Roche. Yeah. Yeah, well, he's he's. Uh, I mean, calling him a dealer is 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 not quite quite adequate. I mean, uh, um, Henri Pierre Rocher was this amazing figure who just. Uh, I mean, it, it would be hard to invent him. He was this this incredible diarist that that kept a diary every day of his life, and he knew everyone in Paris. He was you know friends with Picasso. He introduced people to each other. You know, he introduced Picasso to Gertrude Stein. I mean, this is. This guy was uh, at almost every great moment in the early years of the Paris avant-garde, Rocher was there. And he also happened to be this amazing linguist who spoke uh, you know, perfect English. So he's picked up by um, the, the French government who send, sends him to the United States during the war, the, the First World War. He meets Quinn and he becomes Quinn's great connection to Paris. And in all this time that Quinn is dominating the Paris art world, he only makes two trips to Paris. How does he do it? Well, Rocher is there telling him what to buy by cable, as, as James said, sending these cables, sending these photographs. He would hire Man Ray, a great artist in his own right. But for Quinn, Man Ray was a photographer who took pictures of Picassos. So uh, um, he would say, you know, Man Ray, uh, send, send, send Quinn um, Picasso's newest work and, and, and Man Ray would go to Picasso's studio and take pictures and then, then they would have to be shipped to the United States. That might take a few weeks, depending on the, the speed of the boat. Uh, meanwhile, um, Roche would have to keep the, the seller at, um, you know, uh, either Picasso's dealer or some other dealer or Picasso himself you know, keep him waiting for the answer from Quinn from New York. So it was this amazing connection. You needed you needed a kind of human connection in this age before, um, you know, before everything could be done instantaneously. Um, and Roche was this amazing um, connector. Next, please. 
It is a start on contrast because so much of art dealing is done in this thing now. I mean, paintings are sold on Instagram and, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty wild. So maybe we're going to kind of move along only for the time of sake, but uh, you can see me for the sake of time. Next, please. Leo Stein. Okay. Another great art dealer. Next, please. One of the great art dealers, Daniel Henry Quant, Kahnweiler. Well, here we are, great masterpiece. Um, okay, next. Yeah, so actually you might wanna say briefly about how um, Demoiselle d'Avignon was exhibited. Um, if we go back one slide, Oop. to the, there we are. <laughs> well, should we keep going and get to bar? Maybe we'll do it's that. Fine. Yeah, okay, next please. Next. Yeah, it is a very interesting story because we all know about Picasso's women, but as we're gonna see with the foundation of MoMA, it's some very strong women, which we should talk about in a moment, who really were so instrumental in the foundation of MoMA. Next, please. Another great dealer for Picasso. Next. Next. Uh, one thing that's really remarkable here is that we've got Picasso Three Women at the Spring from 1921. Next slide. Three musicians also from 21. You think about the range of his genius to speak two languages the same year. Next, please. Uh, this was a great moment in your book. So for those who will be reading it, the book is divided into two parts. And right before the end of part one, there's this great quote, a great moment in the book. If anything happened to me and there was the sale of my paintings, there would be a slaughter. Two weeks later, John Quinn was dead. So halfway through the book, we have this remarkable thing happen. The protagonist is gone. And it reminded me very much of in Psycho or in No Country for Old Men, where we're following somebody and they're like, wait, who am I going to follow now? So then in a pretty brilliant way, next slide. Next, we come up with Alfred Barr, 27 years old. Uh, could you talk about Alfred Barr, please? Yes, well, it, it was one of the really kind of difficult challenges of the book, right? <laughs> Killing off your main character maybe is not the best advice um, to a writer. Um, but in this case, it was such a tantalizing beginning as well as an ending because uh, the kind of the entire modern art world of, of its time was small enough that it was kind of encapsulated in all of Quinn's activities and his disappearance from the scene leaves this huge void and also this kind of what's going to happen with his estate. He's left this huge collection. He has no children. It's unclear what was going to happen to it. And one of the few people at the time who appreciated its value, few Americans, that is, um, was this very young kid. I mean, <laughs> Princeton undergraduate, uh, Alfred Barr, um, who, um, as we know today, is remembered as the founder of the founding director of the Museum of Modern Art. But this is before he is, is chosen to run the museum. He encounters Quinn's collection. He understands. And in fact, his first encounter with Quinn's collection in 1921 actually awakens him to modern art. He's a sophomore in college and he's never really seen any of this stuff before. And so there's an amazing connection with Quinn, a kind of intellectual affinity. He understands his what he was up to, he 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 sees his vision, even at, you know, he says later in life, he said, I, I don't understand, how did Quinn do it? He not only picked the best artists, but the best works by the best artists. And then he goes on, uh, he's picked um, at the age of, I think, 27 in 1929, when these um, amazing benefactresses who we, who we remember today, Lily Bliss, Abby Rockefeller, um, and uh, Mary Quinn Sullivan found this new museum. Uh, new York finally needs to have a museum for this art that had no home when Quinn died a few years earlier. 
Um, and who do they pick to run it? But Alfred Barr. So this is kind of the beginning. Um, um, and he emerges kind of out of nowhere and becomes this amazing visionary figure. Uh, but 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 a lot of it has to do with that that encounter. And this is the kind of beginning of his of his quest to bring all this art into a museum, um, which is which is which becomes, you know, takes years. Um, you know, I think part of the reason the book is so um, remarkable is that you did this daring thing with killing off the main character halfway through. I was reading the book in bed and I turned to Jeanette and I said, oh, my God he's going to die. And I couldn't believe it. And I was so stunned that I, it really took my breath away. Um, he had what he called an ulcer, but it turned out he had six years to live with terminal cancer. And for a lawyer of this type of acumen, not to have kind of thought ahead during those six years, it made me think of certain people I know who are you know, completely brilliant, who don't write wills because they feel that if they do, they'll be doomed and then they'll die. I mean, do you have any insights as to why he didn't really make more of a provision for his collection? It's, it's a fascinating question. And it, it, it's ultimately a conundrum because, I mean, it, it, the, the, the signals that he does leave are, are ultimately confusing. And it's clear that he never quite could reconcile his own demise. And, 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 and there's something very connected to his whole vision of art because he also says... Um, at various points, you know, he comes up with this kind of philosophy of living, what he calls living art. And, you know, together with Ezra Pound, who kind of eggs him on. And, you know, Ezra Pound says, um, you know, the great men of the Renaissance, they weren't buying old art. And he's he's talking about the New Yorkers like J.P. Morgan. He said, you know, they think they're, they're Renaissance men because they're buying Renaissance paintings. <laughs> but he said the, the actual you know, the Colonna and the Medici, they, they were buying new art. They were buying the, the avant-garde of their era. And he uses this on Quinn as a kind of philosophy, which Quinn very much adopts. And um, you see this right up until the end. I mean, he's buying, he's buying the Rousseau, Rousseau, the great Rousseau painting, even though he, he must know that he, he, he has months to live. And this is going to die. Um, and, let's keep going through this because I'm only concerned. I think yes. it's clear you and I could speak for about five <laughs> hours, um, but we only have one. So I'd like to get through the story of Alfred Barr because you, you, the reader, you start in part two thinking, oh my God, nothing could match it but it actually does. So next slide, please. Okay, next, we've talked about the women here. Um, super briefly, can you talk about the torpedo and Alfred Barr? Yeah, so, so Alfred Barr has this conundrum. Uh, he wants to, to, I mean, his task, his mission that he's been given is to build a museum of modern art. Now, at this point in time, such a thing doesn't exist. Modern art itself is inherently against the idea of a museum. I mean, it's reacting to all of that. And, you know, even uh, Gertrude Stein famously says, you know, you can be modern or a museum, but you can't be both. And she, she actually says this to Alfred Barr, <laughs> which is interesting, and in refusing to lend him some paintings that, that he's hoping to get. Um, so, but he has to come up with a concept for what can be a museum that is ne nevertheless moving forward through time. And he says, well, the museum is a torpedo. <laughs> um, you have the, the foundational artists at the back in the engine room, you know, Cezanne, Seurat, uh, Van Gogh, Gauguin, um, and then uh, the kind of Paris school pushing forward the what you might call the warhead um, into the into the future, which he hopes will be an American future with American artists learning from this new avant-garde and the museum will be constantly acquiring new work. And it's a very powerful metaphor, very militaristic, but also in keeping with the time, it, you know, Barr is witnessing Hitler come to power. He's witnessing Stalin take over the Soviet Union. He's been to these countries. He, he understands that there's actually a struggle that is very real and it's parallel to the geopolitical struggle happening um, in the political world. And that modern art is not a, a finished story, nor is American acceptance of it. it. It's something that has to be fought for. 
as we look through these slides, I think it's really important to, to know that the book is called Picasso's War, but there are really two other wars, World War I and World War II, that are these dominant um, thunderclouds and a very big force in the book. Uh, next slide, please. I think we're gonna go through some of these a little quickly so we can get to the questions. La Toilette from 1906. Next, please. Um, an amazing moment in the book where they're sending a cable and it goes to, you know, this incredible, you know, um, manner, but they're in New York. Um, it, it, I was just so struck you by how different the communication was and to accomplish this for Alfred Barr to accomplish what he was doing as well. The communication was really difficult. Um, next, please. Sure, Surat. Okay. Uh, yeah, what an incredible moment in your book. I mean, the timing of that is just staggering, right? <laughs> could, could, couldn't have been a more uh, inauspicious moment to be founding a new museum that had no money, uh, no home, and no collection, <laughs> and was hoping to, 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 to rely on the, 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 these, this community of benefactors. So yeah, yeah, it's an astonishing uh, time. You point out that the market lost half its value. Um, next, please. These are some of the characters that populate the book, but I think what we're going to do is just tease you with this, you, the viewers out there. Next. Uh, Mary Therese Voltaire. Well, this led to uh, a real uh, crisis for Picasso. Um, he had run off with Mary Therese Voltaire when she was 17 years old. He was married to Olga, which I think might be the next slide. Uh, maybe we took that out. Um, next, this is, um, you know, Picasso's Chateau, next, again, next, next. You talk quite a bit in a very interesting way about Oscar Schlemmer and the, um, the painting. Let's see the next slide. Yeah, so now we're getting into, um, into the war. Do you want to talk briefly about what happened with this painting? Well, it, I, I think it, it, it sort of, um, it's, it symbolizes this incredible moment for Alfred Bayer, which is that he just, he, he has, um, he's on leave in Germany and it happens to be 1933. He has no idea what's going to happen. And suddenly, you know, Hitler has come to power and even more astonishing you know, this is Alfred Barr knows the Bauhaus. He thinks of Germany as a kind of pinnacle of modern culture. I mean, Germany has all these great museums, uh, you know, a, a real support culture for modern art of the kind that he's hoping to build in the United States. And suddenly Hitler is, comes to power and not only do the Nazis take over, but they immediately attack culture and specifically modern art. Uh, you know, modern artist is taken off the walls of museums. And one of the first um, shows that is attacked is a show of this great Bauhaus artist, Oscar Schlemmer. And, and, and you know, he's he goes to the show and then uh, this is uh, Alfred Barr goes to the show and then he goes a few days later and it's gone. It's just just been taken down. And he arranges to have his wealthy friend, Philip Johnson, acquire it. Um, and uh, so it's it's the first act of kind of rescue as he sees it of getting this art out of out of Europe and out of out of the way of uh, this the, the fascist um, Nazi threat. And also, um, we're not going to be able to get into this too much, but Alfred Barr's wife is a, a key figure. Uh, Alfred Barr seems to suffer from a lot of um, digestive problems and all this, and his his wife really picks up the baton and moves it. Um, Quite a bit. I love that you paint these pictures of these strong women in your book. Uh, next slide, please. Great photo of these two. Wow. Next. Next. Huh. Right. A hell of a cable to reach to, to get when you're setting up a Picasso show, right? Well, I mean, this is this is again, this is this is the mid '30s, but at, it's it's a it's a kind of repetitive part of of the book that they they keep trying to do these shows, and almost you know without fail something goes wrong uh, every time. 
Um, and yeah, there's been a new, there's been an uprising in Paris and, and Picasso meanwhile has decided not to lend, lend paintings. Next, please. Next. More of the people that populate the book. Next, please. Uh, this is a very interesting story that you go into. The huge popularity of this show, which kind of set a precedent, right? I mean, in America, to have a show, could you remind me how many people saw the show as it traveled throughout America? Oh, gosh, I I, I don't know if I, I, I have the figure in, in mind, but it went to, I think, 15 different cities, ultimately. And it was this incredible kind of serendipitous moment that, 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 you know, Alfred Barr was so foresighted to, to seize upon. There was this unique opportunity to borrow, you know, all of Van Gogh's greatest works were basically in two collections in the Netherlands. Um, uh, Helena Kroer Muller, this great uh, German Dutch collector and um, uh, Van Gogh's nephew had the other collection in Amsterdam. And so at this one you know, in the late thirties, there's suddenly this moment where Barr is able to borrow uh, the best works from both of those collections and bring them to the United States. And what, what is really innovative here and which seems so obvious to us today is to have this touring show. This was a completely new thing. You know, it's not like he's just bringing them to New York and, and having the show and sending them back. They're gonna go, you know, he, he gets four or five museums to, to back the show, first of all, because it was extremely expensive for this little fledgling museum at the time. MoMA still had no money. And he teams up with, with, with and, and actually it was a secret, but they charged quite a lot of money for this show. Um, <laughs> and Barr didn't want this to get out because he didn't want any precedent to be set. But ultimately the show was the first show that actually made money for the museum, which is astonishing. Um, so it goes on this year long tour, goes to the West coast, San Francisco, um, there, I think there, there, there were, there was, um, you know, efforts to bring it to Canada. Um, ultimately in the end, um, the Dutch lenders finally said, okay, <laughs> you need to send these paintings back, but it changed. It really did change the national culture. It, it, it reached enough cities and to, to have, you can really see this kind of critical turning point. In, in how Americans talked about modern art, wrote about it, read about it. Um, and, uh, you know, Alfred Barr talk, says, you know, I, I'm seeing people at these shows that never, don't, don't look like the people that usually come to, to our shows. Um, and uh, he's, he's created this new culture, which becomes a model really for what happens later with uh, Picasso. And I think what we see today, this is how, how big shows happen. So Hugh, I know we're going to save some time for questions. We have only 10 minutes left. So next, please. Okay, next. Huh. Yeah, this is really wild because Picasso, one of the most prolific artists ever, in 1935, he stops painting uh, next. And it's really uh, a fascinating thing which Hugh gets into, which is that... Um, Anything he was going to paint, Olga, his who he's in a horrid divorce with, is going to get, and they've basically um, stopped his uh, prolific nature. Next, please. And by the way, he made his bed that way. <laughs> you know, honestly, he runs off with the seventeen-year-old Mary Therese, this Maya, his daughter. Next, please. Um, God, what an amazing piece in 1935 to kind of almost like um, lead his way out of this um, stasis that he was in. He does this remarkable print. Yeah, and I just want to say here that he actually gives this print to Alfred Barr. It's a very important moment. Um, and, and Picasso, and <laughs> Picasso often portrayed himself as the bull. And it's such a fascinating thing with the candle in a dark room and, you know, all this uh, incredible imagery. A pretty nice gift though, right? Next, please. Guernica. I'm not sure if we're gonna have time to really talk about Guernica because I know we're gonna open it up for questions, but obviously one of the great masterpieces. But what Hugh does is talk about how it was really reviled when it was uh, first exhibited. It's gonna be fascinating for everybody out there to read it. And I really, I do suggest this book for people who both love Picasso and those who don't. Um, 
because <laughs> this is really almost like a looming shadow in the book. It's really the story of the men and women that populate the book um, that make it so vibrant. Um, I think we had a couple more slides, but maybe we we're gonna go to the Q and A. I would like to say one thing. Um, Hugh, I have Picasso books literally more than my outstretched arms on a bookcase. This book was so vivid and new that um, you did something really remarkable. Now, Brittany, do you wanna read some questions for Hugh, please? I would love to. Okay. And please um, feel free to add some more questions in the chat if, if, if you'd like. Uh, here we go. So <laughs> going back to John Quinn's early interest in cubism, I believe that he had commissioned a four part analytical cubist mural for his library that was never realized. The project would have been one of the most important commissions in early modernism, not unlike Dr. Barnes's commissions by Matisse. Did Hugh come across this in his research? Um, you? Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. No, that, that actually was not John Quinn, believe it or not. Um, it was another, um, uh, uh, an, another interesting patron of the time who was, was considerably more wealthy than Quinn. Um, and um, uh, I'm, tr I'm trying to think of the name. Um, the, the, this library commission is a fascinating story because Ultimately, this this collector who had spent a lot of time in, in Paris and 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 had this family house in 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 Brooklyn in in I think Brooklyn Heights um, <laughs> was going to have this analytic cubist library, but in, he kind of got cold feet and nothing ever happened with this. Um, there is a great essay about it um, by um, the late MoMA curator um, 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 Bill Rubin. Um, if, 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 if you're interested, but, but, but again, this, this is a moment when the, that, you know, history could have been different. And I think that that's one of the things that, that, that I tried to emphasize in my book throughout this story, things could have gone a different way. Um, and, and often they did. Um, so there, there was no sort of sense of, of, um, you know, inevitability about this story at all, really. It, it was so important, the, these, these characters around Picasso that made, uh, made this cultural shift. Um, someone also asked if you could go into more specifically why the book, why did you title the book Picasso's War? Yeah, it's it, it's interesting. You know, so many people have asked about this, and um, I actually think it it, it it perfectly captures it because it was a struggle. It was a. I mean, it there, there was actually. I mean, at a certain point in the story, <laughs> uh, Alfred Barr says we 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 have to think of of art as more important than war, and this is. You know, in the opening months of World War II, he's trying desperately to get these last Picassos out of Europe, including this this collection of sculptures that ultimately don't make it. But but he gets gets a, a lot of other things. Um, and there was a militancy um, really from the beginning. You see it in Quinn, um, the way he talks about the Armory Show conquering, invading America. Um, and you see it in, in Alfred Barr with his torpedo and, uh, it's, it's really a war, um, and, uh, it's very unclear who's going to win. James, is there anything else that you wanted to dive into with Hugh? I know, I mean, I know a million things, but. <laughs> Hugh, just on a personal note, I'm curious, um, were one of your parents great researchers and were you brought to museums by your parents to look at art? I mean, how did you come to have this incredible aptitude as a researcher and a writer? I'm, I'm, I'm going to answer that. And then I actually want to ask you a question, James, because, because I'm, I'm curious uh, from your, from your, um, from your, your background in, in the, in the art world as well. Um, so I actually, I guess one of, one of the sort of turning points for me was I spent my uh, junior year of high school in Paris and um, uh, my, my father was teaching at the University of Paris and um, I, we had this, ha in those days, 
the Musée d'Orsay was open late on Thursdays and we would go every Thursday and look at some stuff. And I, I just, I love the building, uh, you know, this former train station that was turned into this really kind of, I, I'd never been to a museum like this before. And it was full of stuff that that was new to me. And um, I think that um, kind of um, excited my interest. But again, also I've been always sort of a, a renegade and, um, you know, I, I, I studied art in, in both in college and graduate school, but from outside the art world. So I was always interested in that sort of political environment of of art and um, um, political theory, political thought, what was happening in the background, um, patronage. Um, and so if you're interested in those issues, inevitably you you dive into deep research. But I think what what was exciting for me about this book, and I'll just say, one thing was, and this is what what James brought up is, I mean, it was just, I was just a gift that I was able to have this material. And when you have not just what was happening every day, but sometimes hour by hour, you know, a cable comes in (laughs) two hours later, something else happens. And and, and occasionally, you know, there's this great visit um, to Picasso's garden in Fontainebleau um, in the summer of 1921, uh, I I had this scene from several perspectives. So several people that were present in this on this day when Quinn visits Picasso wrote their own account. So I have Rocher's diary. I have Jean Foster's diary. So you really have this. I mean, it's almost a cubist vision. You know, you're seen from multiple perspectives at once, and it it it, it was so enriching to me to be able to use that material. Sometimes discovering dialogue. Um, uh, Marga Barr would write to Alfred, who was, you know, unable to travel to Paris. She would she would sort of recite line by line what Picasso had told her. Um, and, you know, I've had people ask me, you know, how do you know what he said? Well, <laughs> uh, we we do actually know. So 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 it was just a very lucky um, um, era to be working on these issues. But I, I, I want to ask you, James, I'm just curious because I'm very interested to know to what extent this early 20s art world and the way the kind of gallerist um, dynamics worked with the art world, how that is different or or perhaps even similar in some ways to, to today. Um, I mean, I, I think of the extent that a lot of really exciting shows now do happen in galleries and not in museums. And we're at this kind of new moment where you have you know, curators, great curators working on shows in galleries and and, uh, art historians writing catalogs for galleries, and I, I just think, oh, that's so interesting because this is kind of what Rosenberg was was doing in the in the twenties. I think you know, I think of it as a relay race a little bit that between museums and dealers, there are remarkable shows happening in galleries right now. The fact that you can walk into a gallery and see it for free uh, is still a staggering thing to me. I'm going to New York tomorrow. I can't wait. I love going to galleries. However, if you were to look at, let's say, one example, late Picasso, Gert Schiff did a remarkable show at the Guggenheim in 1984. I was working at Nodler at that point. And I was given the uh, invitation to this opening. It's a black tie opening. I'm so excited. Still a kid. And I was told Picasso was great up until, and they gave me various theories Mm -hmm. Up until 1920, up until 1938, up until 1947, up until 1957, everybody hated the late paintings. Gert Schiff was a genius who saw how important these works were that had been reviled when they were shown in Avignon first. So that show happens. Then the Tate does their show of late Picasso. And then John Richardson, a great art historian, a brilliant man, great writer, of course, the Picasso, um, you know, the, the greatest scholar of Picasso there will probably will ever be. He does two shows at Gagosian Gallery. And then those shows turn the market. So I was working at Gallery Young Cruget from 85 to 87. Um, that's where I became so infatuated with Picasso. Um, I took a summer off between the two jobs, went to Europe with Jeanette. Um, I brought a bunch of books with me. And I said, we're going to museums, we're going to look at Picasso. So I was in the inner workings of the Picasso world with Gallery on Cruget. But I think that if you look at just that one example, it's museum, museum, gallery, gallery, and then boom, kaboom. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that um, 
you know, everybody tries to hate the mega galleries, but they do great shows and they can act quickly because they have the financing and they don't have the board meetings. They can decide to do a show, get someone like John Elderfield to do a show who was, you know, for God's sake, you know, head of MoMA. And then he does a show in a gallery. I think we're just fortunate that we have both. But I do think there are shows like last week, I saw a great show of ceramics that were made by slaves at the Met. Um, it was completely new to me. It was a revelation. I saw it. And in 15 minutes, my vision, my life has changed. So that's why I think both museums and galleries can do that. Um, any other questions for Hugh? Otherwise, should we shy a lot of, A lot of thank yous. And I also just wanted to say thank you so much to both of you. This is, I mean, we all could, I think, could listen for another hour as well. It's, you're both so passionate and, and lovely. So the Library and House of Books and the Town of Kent, thanks you both. And also, I think the Kent House of Books, uh, for anybody who's interested, run over and get a copy. I will tell you that's going to be my holiday gift this year. Um, I've ordered a slew of them and I'll be ordering more. So I guess um, if you want to get a free copy, just come here and buy a painting and then you can <laughs> copy of his book. Um, and House uh, of Books has um, signed copies, to be I clear. Would like, I would like to tell you, though, that, um, Hugh, I read constantly. And I, I must have, I don't know how many books on Picasso. This book was a revelation. You did something so important with this book. And even for those who view Picasso as he should have been me too. He was sexist, all that stuff that I hear, blah, blah, blah. He was a great artist, but the story isn't just about Picasso and Picasso's very much in the background. I would tell everybody to either go to the library if they're in Kent or go to your bookstore and grab a copy. So Hugh, thank you for what you did and congratulations. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. I really enjoyed this. Thank you. Yeah, so thank much. you, everybody who joined us tonight. Uh, very exciting to have this conversation. <laughs> Good night.